Hi, I'm John White, an academic who specializes in Indo-European mythology. And today I'm going to talk about an interesting story that holds a far bigger secret than many realize. It is about two gods who, in Viking tales are brothers, and one kills the other, which leads to a string of events which touches on much mythology of the Old Norse. And as we dive into this and some other stories, we'll see that these two gods have an origin much older than these tales. And the name of these gods? Balder and his brother Hothor. In these Viking tales, Balder is a son of Odin, the chief god of the Aesir, and a well-respected and loved god associated with light and beauty. He is also an interesting figure academically, as he is sometimes considered an analogue of Jesus by Abrahamic academics because of his divine nature, and because he is considered a dying and rising god, and this has resulted in much literature being created about him. And so, in this video we are going to cover a lot of information. I'm going to show why he isn't an analogue of Jesus, and I will talk of the two very old stories we have of Balder and Hulthur where the source texts exist. I'll ask questions about some of their strange goings on, and then by using these texts alongside other information, I will recreate what could be the original story of these two gods that probably has its origins from several thousand years ago. And if you stay until the very end of the video, I will use this to explain who Balder and Hothor really were. And as a slight spoiler, they were probably very significant Germanic gods at one point in time. And so before I begin, I really would recommend that you grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Crackenfold. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Boulder, then let me give you a synopsis of how his story is introduced in Old Norse mythology. In a poem called Baldur's Druma in the Poetic Edda, which is a compilation of poems written over 700 years ago, Baldur dreams of his own death, and he tells this to the gods of the Aesir, a council of the Old Norse gods. And as a result of this, his parents, who are Odin and Frigg, two very important gods, set about trying to find out if this dream is a prophecy and how to stop it happening if it is. Now, to do this, Frigg made every animate and inanimate thing in the world promise not to hurt Baldur, and Odin went to the underworld to raise a seeress who could prophesy what would happen to his son. Frigg gets the agreement of all things not to hurt Baldur, but says that there grows a shoot of a tree to the west of Valhalla, and it is called mistletoe. It seemed too young to me to demand an oath from it, and more about this later. Odin, in the meantime, travels to Hel, part of the Nordic underworld, and raises a seeress who has the ability to prophesy, and she says that Baldur will be killed, and that it would be another of his Odin's sons who would kill him, and vengeance would then come from another of his sons, one that had not been born as yet, and that women would then weep and throw their necklaces in the air on the news of Baldur's death. This story of Baldur's death from an Old Norse mythological perspective is worth knowing as it connects to many other stories in Norse mythology, and is worth a listen just for that. And I'll talk more about these links towards the end of the video, just to reduce the chance of me spoiling things for you. However, if you're familiar with the stories of the Eddas, or with the Saxo Grammaticus's writing on Baldur in his History of the Danes, then there are chapters in this video allowing you to skip ahead, but please don't do that before pressing the subscribe button and the notification bell, which is somewhere here. That bell is really important for the YouTube algorithm, delaying Ragnarok and allowing this channel to grow, as well as making you aware of when future videos are made available. And with that, I shall begin properly. And the place to start is with Frigg, Baldur's mother. And when she found out about Baldur's dream and made everything promise not to hurt Baldur, rocks, metal, fire, water, she left out one object, mistletoe. And her reasoning was that it was too young to worry about. And perhaps in a world of myth, such things never get old, and so she was right to not worry about it. But to continue the story of Baldur, it was when Loki, the trickster god of the Old Norse, 
who, when turning up to a meeting of the gods, saw that all the gods were enjoying throwing things at Balder and that he was unharmed. Loki, seeing this, felt a little jealous you know, of not having all the attention on himself. And so, in true Loki style, hatched a devious plan to find out what was really going on. And so, he disguises himself as a woman and went to talk to Frigg and asked what was happening. Why were people throwing things at Balder? And Frigg said, the Balder was immune to all things except mistletoe, a plant that grew far away west of Valhalla. And so the gods had fun proving that nothing else could hurt a sum. And so finding out that mistletoe is Balder's weakness, Loki disappeared and travelled all the way to the west of Valhalla, a far and distant place where he found this plant and brought it back. And when he returned, he saw Hothor, Balder's blind brother, who was not participating in this event, and said to him, Why are you not throwing things at your brother, Balder, like the other gods? And Hothor said, Because I cannot see where Balder is, and because I have no weapon. And with that, Loki put a branch of the mistletoe into Hothor's hand and told him where to throw. The branch went through Balder, leaving him with a mortal wound. Balder fell and died there on the spot. And all the gods were silent, too shocked to speak, for this was considered the saddest, most unluckiest thing ever happened to gods or men, and tears were shed. Balder's mother, Frigg, was distraught, and it was Hermathor, Odin's son, who responded to her call to go to hell and bargain with Hel, the goddess of death, to get Balder back. Odin allowed Hermathor to ride Slepnir, his eight-legged horse, to Hel for speed, and off he rode away. With this news, it was time for the gods of the Aesir to prepare a funeral for Balder. At the funeral was Odin, Frigg, the Valkyries, and Odin's ravens, Freya, Heimdall, Freya too, and in attendance were many frost and mountain giants, or Yudnar. A par was built on Balder's ship, Ringhami, the largest of the ships, and Balder's body laid upon it. Odin walked up to Balder's body and whispered in his ear, and laid a golden arm ring called Drupnir on Balder's chest. It was a magical ring that would produce eight similarly weighted and sized golden rings every nine nights. However, what Odin whispered would remain a riddle forever. Even today, it is a mystery of Old Norse mythology. Then, Balder's wife, Nana, went to the pyre to pay her last respects to her husband. But on seeing Balder, her heart broke with grief, and she died right there and then. And so she too was placed on the pyre, next to Balder. Balder's horse, fully harnessed, was then led to the pyre, and the pyre was set alight. Thor then walked up, stood next to it, and consecrated the pyre. But as he did so, a dwarf called Lit ran in front of Thor, and he was kicked by the gods straight into the pyre and burned to death. And as an aside, it is thought that it could have been a servant of Balder, and so, with Balder dead, there would be no need for him to be alive. But it does seem an odd line to have put in that story. But as the gods went to launch the ship, he would not move, and so they had to ask for the help of a Jotun. And we often think of these as giants, and the one they asked was called Hirokin. She had arrived at the funeral riding a wolf with snakes for reins, and as she went to the back of the boat to push it into the water, four berserkers were required to restrain her mount, and they found this task impossible, and so had to kill her wolf. But still, Hirokin pushed the ship and pushed so hard that the land quaked, and this annoyed Thor, who grabbed Njolnir and went to smash the giantess around the head. But the gods pleaded with him to stop and calm down, and so he did. For a while at least. Although, in the Skalskaldpamor, it does say that Thor killed a number of Jotnar at the funeral, including Hirokin. And with that, the funeral was complete. But what happened to Hermathor, who was riding Slipnir to hell? Well, he rode for nine nights through deep, dark valleys, 
and over the Muskuthara Bridge and into Hell's Hall, where he saw his brother Balder sitting on a seat of honour. Hermathor stayed one night with his brother before trying to persuade Hel to let Balder return to the living world. And Hel said she would, but on one condition, that it must be proved that the world loved Balder as much as it was said, and to do this, everyone must weep for him. But if just one person refused to, then Balder would be kept in Hel. Hermathor left, but not before Balder gave him Drupnir, which Hermathor would return to Odin as a keepsake. And when Hermathor returned to Asgard, he told the gods what Hel had said, and then the Aesir sent messengers all across the world to tell everyone and everything to weep for Balder. And everyone did. Except for one, one giantess, and her name can be translated to thanks. And she said that she would not weep for Balder, for she received no good from him when alive, nor dead. And so he should stay in hell. And so Balder remained in hell. It was thought that that giantess, thanks, was Loki in disguise. And so this, along with Loki's influence on the death of Balder, meant he was hunted down by the gods. They took with them Kvasir, the most knowledgeable man in existence, and... If you're unaware, Kvasir was the person who was crafted from the spittle of the gods after the Asiavania War, and was the most intelligent person alive, and is linked to the Mead of Poetry, which you can hear more about in this video. But for this story, it was Kvasir who worked out Loki was disguising himself as a salmon in a river, and the gods tried to fish him out, before Thor eventually managing to grab the salmon by the tail, which is why salmon have tapered bodies down to their fins. The gods then pinned Loki down, brought his sons to him, killed them in front of him, and then used one of his sons' entrails for bonds, attaching him to three great rocks, and those bonds turned into iron. Above Loki's head, a poisonous snake was fixed to drip poison on Loki's face. Loki's wife tried to capture the drips in a bowl, but when she had to empty the bowl, a drip of poison would hit Loki in the face, and he shook in pain. And that is the cause of earthquakes. And there Loki would remain until he broke free of his bonds, as predicted by the Ceres, whom Odin spoke with when finding out about Baldur's dreams. But that escape would not happen until Ragnarok was happening. But when he does escape, a giant called Durinda will have a child, Odin's son, and his name will be Voli. And at one day old, he will kill Huthor in revenge for Balder's death at Ragnarok. And that is the story from Norse mythology of how Balder was killed by his brother Huthor, and how Loki was eventually punished, and how Voli gave revenge. Now, within this story, there are scenes that link to many parts of Old Norse mythology, from the Voldespoor with Loki's bonds and Voli's revenge, and with Odin raising a series for prophecy when he heard about Baldur's dreams, and it was on his journey to the series that Odin in Baldur's Dromo encounters Gama, the Indo-European Hellhound, which I talk about in this video. Then there are links to Skarskarpamol, which talks of the giantess Hilokin and to the Mead of Poetry through Kvasir, which I've talked about. We can see from this that this story has been written by Snorri Sturluson in the Gilfanginin to time with other stories. Snorri was a fine storyteller. And this can add issues to us understanding what are and aren't problems with the story. But having heard the old Norse version of the story, you probably have a few unanswered questions. To me, knowing the answers I think we're looking for, these questions are, why didn't Loki kill Balder directly? Why use mistletoe as a weapon? Why is Hothor blind? And why is there so much crying and weeping? Answering these questions will help us understand the story's origins and who Balder and Hulthor really are. So, how do we answer these questions? Well, one of the best ways is to find another version of the story, and this will help us understand what the original source story could be, and the differences in characters and motifs uh, may guide us into understanding why those differences exist. And luckily, we do have another version of the story from Saxo Grammaticus. Who wrote the history of the Danes. 
is a very different story to the Old Norse, and much longer, and so I'll tell an abridged version of it. When Saxo Grammaticus wrote the history of the Danes, he put within it a version of the story of Balder and Hawthor, which is somewhat different to the Old Norse version. He is also much longer too, as Saxo wanders around various distractions in Danish history. He certainly isn't the storyteller Snorri Sturluson is, and within this story I'll use Nordic versions of the names rather than the Latinized versions that Saxo uses, which should make it easier to follow along and make comparisons yourself. I will also point out key differences as we journey through it. And so here is a very abridged version of the story. In this story, Balder is again Odin's son, but born by a mortal woman, and he one day sees Nana and lusts after her. This woman is his wife in Old Norsemith. However, any courtship is going to be difficult as Nana's foster brother, an exceptional warrior and a man of eloquence, also wants to marry her, and his name is Hothor. And so in this story, Hothor and Balder aren't related. Also, the term foster in Germanic and Old Norse refers as much to best friend of the family as opposed to how we would consider the term fosterin today. As this story moves forward, Balder meets Nana's father, King Giva, and informs him of his intentions. And whilst this happens, Hothor meets some forest maidens who were guiding the course of battles, which pretty much sounds like Valkyries to me, but it isn't explicitly stated that they are within the text. And these maidens inform Hothor of Baldur's plans, but advise him against attacking Baldur as Baldur is a demigod. Now Nana's father, Givar, is afraid to displease Baldur as Baldur is invulnerable and cannot be overpowered, a theme we see in Old Norse Smith. However, Givar tells Hothor that there is a satyr named Miming who owns a sword that can kill Baldur and a bracelet that increases the wealth of those who wears it. And getting these may allow Hothor to triumph in a battle over Baldur. But to reach Miming, there is a great journey that must be completed across the land of perpetual frost. Hothor sets off and completes this journey and overcomes all the obstacles necessary in obtaining Mimin's treasures. This is a very similar objective going west of Valhalla for Loki in the Old Norse myth. But whilst Hothor is away, Baldur invades Gervar's country and pursues Nana, who publicly rejects him on the grounds that she is no match for a demigod. But secretly, her choice is because she prefers Hothor. Baldur, now in league with Odin and Thor, then equips a fleet of ships and attacks Gervar. To everybody's surprise, including Saxo's, judging by the way this part was written, they are defeated and flee. We also now find out that one of the forest maidens, the ones who were probably Valkyries, gave Hothor a coat of invulnerability, and this has aided his victory. And in this moment of happiness, Hothor marries Nana, and they leave for Sweden. Baldur is now taunted by his enemies, but still has the passion to fight, and he returns to find Hothor and defeats him in battle. But love proves a more effective weapon than swords, and now that Baldur has the advantage in war, he begins to pine, tormented in his sleep, by images of Nana. A third battle between Baldur and Hothor then ensues, in which Hothor is again defeated, and he heads for the wilderness to retire, but he is criticised and mocked by his subjects for hiding. But as it happens, on his way to the wilderness, Hothor meets another group of forest maidens, who assure Hothor that all is not lost, and that if he succeeds in the eating of Baldur's magic food, which helps Baldur's invulnerability and demigod's powers, the victory will be Hothor's. However, he fails in that task, but does manage to get a belt of perfect sheen, and a girdle that brings victory from some fairies. And after this, a final meeting then occurs between Baldur and Hothor, and Hothor inflicts a mortal wound on Baldur, who dies three days later and is given a royal funeral, although there is far less going on on that funeral than there is in the Old Norse version. Baldur is then later avenged by Bols, a son of Odin and Rindar, the same name as used in the Old Norse myth as the mother of the child who avenges. 
Baldur's Death. As you have probably gathered by now, these two stories do have some key similarities, suggesting they're from the same source, but there are some differences to suggest some significant alterations. And there's also enough information alongside knowledge of Indo-European mythology to allow us to answer the questions we put to ourselves about why didn't Loki kill Baldur? Why use mistletoe? Why is Hothor blind? And why were so many people weeping about it? Now, I could easily give an hour to each of these questions if I were to answer them fully. But unless there is demand for me to do this in the comments below, I'm just going to jump straight to the best answers based on my evaluation of the evidence and supposition, allowing us to hopefully keep this video to less than an hour in length. So question one, why didn't Loki kill Bolter himself? Well, he did. Now, some of you may be slightly puzzled by this, but let me explain. Hothor may seem like an unlucky god to you, in the wrong place at the wrong time, but he is the one killing Bolter and does so in both versions of the story we've listened to. But Loki, he is in the story for a reason, and it is probably because there were versions of the story that had him killing Boulder. And this has merit as the story has changed. But what we also see is that both Othor and Loki have chthonic properties. They are placed in stories for the purpose of doing something bad. And I'll explain more about this a little later when answering the third question about Hothor's blindness. But if we take this understanding and then allow Snorri Sturluson and his story creating abilities to combine all the various versions of the myth together, understanding that both Loki and Hothor have this chthonic characteristic, then allowing the act of Loki making Hothor do this deed, well that not only fits with how Loki acts, but also allows Snorri to bring both these characters into the same piece, and therefore allow them to continue with their underlying chthonic properties for his readers to understand. But I can understand if you think, I'm stretching things a bit far here. So let me carry on, and all will make more sense by the time we finish answering all the questions. Now the story of mistletoe being used is recalled in the Gilfanging of the Prose Edda, written by Snorri Sturluson, and in it Snorri writes that Frigg says, There grows a shoot of a tree to the west of Valhalla, and it is called mistletoe. It seemed too young to me to demand an oath from it. Now this is interesting for two reasons. Firstly, that a journey has to be made to a place a long way away, to retrieve the item that will eventually kill Boulder, and this is true for the Danish myth too, where the land of perpetual frost must be crossed, a place known as Fensilia, and as such, it is a motive often found in tales of myth and legend. This aspect must be part of an original myth. But one other aspect to consider about this point is that with one place where it was found being with Valhalla associated with the dead, and the other far north, Fensilar, and that name too is associated with the dead, then perhaps the secret and the thing that kills Boulder can only be found in the land of the dead. Now, the secondary interest, although it is a crux of this answer, mistletoe doesn't grow in Iceland, the place where this story was written, and it also only grows in very limited places in Norway and Sweden. It is therefore fair to say that Snorri probably had no real idea what mistletoe was. And this view can be reinforced when reviewing how Snorri describes it, being ambiguous as to the plant's properties. In fact, he actually says it stands as though a tree, something that mistletoe does not do. The fact is that Snorri knew the Volusbol and what happened within it, and so had to work with mistletoe a plant we know as being not good for making a spear with. But if Snorri had changed mistletoe to a weapon made of metal, well that would have changed the whole myth, and the promises that Frigg had to ask for the materials of the world. But in the Danish myth, it is a sword that kills Boulder, and this sword has a name, as it is mentioned in a number of tales in the Nordic world. 
and it is sometimes referred to as miming sword, is often translated to mistletain. The suffix of tain is found in a number of swords and names, and so offers the explanation that corruption in translation from the sword name mistletain to the Old Norse word mistletain has occurred, mistletain being mistletoe. But this word is not etymologically linked to any other Old Norse word. No one else in Old Norse myth is killed by mistletoe, and so it seems like this probably isn't the answer that is most acceptable. The view I think is probable, most probable, is that we must first consider how many people have died from plants and myths, and who have died from swords and spears. And the answer is for both many. These are objects often used. And we see that plants may have been converted into swords and spears as myths evolve, but rarely, if ever, do we see a weapon converted into a plant during the myth's evolution. And so it seems likely that the plant that kills Boulder is in fact from a more original version of the myth. But the name, yeah, it's adapted. It's coming from English mythology where mistletoe had many superstitious properties. And this being picked up by Vikings who were very keen on English mythology and English stories, well, this name for a plant could well have sounded like a kenning for a sword. And so picked up and then used by poets. In effect, it was a plant that killed Baldur in the original myth, but not mistletoe. This was brought in to the myth later. But if you think it's unlikely a god could be killed by a plant, then to add strength to this, there is a story of King Vicar in Gultrek Saga, who is killed by a plant, a reed. And we see this in the Estonian epic about Kele Vipiog, the hero who takes a reed and chews it after taking a mortal wound. But we also see the thistle in Nordic tales and in various regions around it. And that's used as an alternative to the magic of the reed. Uh, from the runic curse of Thistle Missile Kissel to Gertha, who was told she would be like a thistle if she refused to marry Freya. So perhaps in the very original story, a reed was used to kill Baldur. Now, another motif that seems out of place is that Hothor is blind. Why would the one-eyed god Odin have a blind son then? It doesn't normally happen in myth. And so some academics have seen this as Hothor being a representation of Odin from an earlier version of the myth. But this goes against everything written in the Eddas. I mean, Odin would not murder his own children. He may banter with them, but to kill them is not something he would do. And so Hothor was blind for a reason. He has to be. Although he has lost his reason in the more evolved and later version of the Danish story. So what else could be going on here? I mean, the Icelandic version of the myth tends to have older parts of the story in it, having looked at the first two questions. So he could suggest that Hothor is blind and thonic because he is the opposite of Baldr, the god of light and beauty. In effect, Baldr, light and divine, loved by all, Hothor, dark, chthonic, and has no need for the light. But why? It doesn't fit in with the story very well, or how we know the gods. Well, perhaps we don't know the god Baldr that well, but we may do if we answer the next question. This final question, well, almost, was why was there so much weeping going on? The CRS prophesied to Odin that women would weep for Baldr, and after he died, the gods wept. Hell told the gods that all things must weep. And to be honest, we had to ask this question, even if it wasn't obvious, because it allows us to understand what is going on with Boulder. You see, weeping in myth and religion is often associated with deities who control the rain, agricultural gods. And it feels like Hell's request for everyone to weep is associated with the oldest type of folklore and probably was found in the very earliest versions of the myth. In Saxo's version of the myth, there are no tears, but Boulder strikes the ground and a spring is created again, a nod to agricultural attributes Boulder may have possessed. To me, Boulder is more than just a shiny light and beautiful. He has elements of gods that control the weather, controls agriculture, and with that, and the answers to the other questions, it 
allows me to present what was probably one of the oldest versions of the story with Boulder and Huthor in it. There was a time long ago, before the Vikings, before Angles and Saxons, before the Romans invaded our ancestors' land, the place where the Germanic people lived, or perhaps the more northerly of these. And these people had within their pantheon two deities, a sky god, whose name meant shining light, and his opposite, not necessarily a brother or a twin, but the ruler of the underworld. Their names were Baldur and Hothwar, respectively. Baldur would have had a number of purposes, depending on the locales needed at the time, whether it was for rain or for light or the sun or vegetation. And he would have been seen as a god who aided agriculture. He had a plant that was sacred to him, probably a reed, maybe a thistle. And whilst Baldur was invulnerable, this thistle reed was his weakness, but it grew in a secret place so far away that it was of no real concern to him. As time passed, both Baldur and Huthor set eyes upon a woman who they both fell in love with, who we now know was named as Nana. But she loved Baldur, and this upset Huthor, the god of the underworld. Huthor used deceit and cunning to persuade Baldur's mother to give up what was Baldur's weakness and the secret location of the thistle reed. And once he had found this out, he travelled across the world to retrieve it. And once done so, he returned, where he then confronted Baldur and then pierced Baldur's skin with the magical thistle reed. Baldur's mother was bereft, full of sadness and remorse, and tried all she could to bring him back from the dead, but she failed. And so Baldur remained in the underworld, and there continued to look after the crops and the weather, and was mourned by those who worshipped him. So, what is this story? Well, it is a widespread version of a dying god myth. Not a dying and rising god myth, just a dying god myth. The weeping, the light of Baldur, all point to him being a sky god, and Hothor the opposite, a god of the underworld. And the motif of being locked in the underworld is an exact copy of the Egyptian god Osiris' mythology. And we also see weeping is linked to the Near East deities such as Dumzid and Tammuz. The story's origins are agricultural and come from the Near East, and so possibly pre-Proto-Indo-European at its very source. In effect, the people who influenced early European farmers what we can say for sure is that the origins behind this story are much older than the Vikings, older than Jesus, and another example of Neolithic and Indo-European migration whose stories are so good that they have stood the test of time. And understanding these is the reason I have a passion for my work. Back to the start, is Baldur an analogue of Jesus? Well, it was Sophus Buger, the same Buger who thought Odin hanging from a tree was a metamorphosis of the crucifixion myth, of the Gospels, who thought that there was a connection. But the truth is that Jesus was not passive in his teachings and did not live a charmed life. Jesus knew he was going to be crucified and so sacrificed himself for a purpose that he was aware of. And all these things are the exact opposite to how we view Baldur. They are not linked in any significant way. And on that note, I want to say thank you so much for watching and all your kind words of support. Please don't forget to comment below what you like, what you want to hear more of. Please don't forget to like the video. And after much demand, I have started a Patreon account, which I'll link in the description below, along with references to text I use for this and to the poems. And until the next video, please stay safe and well. And this was Crackenfold.